Frank Einstein and the Antimatter Motor by Frank Sheska. Chapter 1. Exactly 48 hours, two rotations of the Earth earlier. Night, darkness, flash! A bright bolt of lightning splits the dark and flickers over the skylight. Frank Einstein looks up from his work. He counts out loud. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Crack! Boom! The sound wave vibration of thunder rattles the old iron-framed windows of Frank's workshop and science laboratory. How, do you, how come do you think he was counting 1,001, 1,002? Um... Uh, I don't know. Let's find out. Five seconds between light and sound for every mile. One mile away, Frank calculates, using the difference between the almost instant speed of light, the much slower speed of sound. Right on time. Oh, it looks, looks like he was counting so that he could know how far away the lightning was in the storm. Oh, yeah. Are you sure this will work? asks Watson, pulling on long yellow rubber dishwashing gloves to protect himself. Because, man, this seems pure crazy. It's perfect, Frank answers. Perfect my mom and dad are gone again on one of their travel hotspot trips. Perfect Grandpa Al let me set up my lap in his garage and use all his great repair shop junk. And perfect we can use this lightning to supercharge my smart bot to life and win the Midville Science Prize. Lightning flashes. Thunder boom. That 100000 cash prize will pay off all Grandpa Al's bills, and the smart bot will help us invent anything else we want. Frank secures the final copper wire in his smart bot's brain. What could go wrong? Well, remember that time we were making race cars? Frank holds out his hand like a doctor in an operating room. Vacuum switch. And you bolted the jet engine onto the baby stroller? GPS unit. And you decided it would be more fuel efficient without the brakes? Skull piece. I can show you the scar. Skull piece. Watson looks around the workbench covered with the bits and parts of 20 years worth of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing repairs. He picks up a shiny metal piece with two slots. You mean this toaster thing? Flash! Frank looks up at the skylight and counts. 1,001, 1,000, boom! Less than half a mile. Yes! Skull piece. Now, what do you think he's doing? Um, I don't know. Hmm. He's got to be up to something. I think he is up to something. Watson tosses the toaster skull to Frank. Frank screws the piece into place. He lays the smart bot in a rusty red wagon bed roped oh, into I a make, harness. What? Oh, he's making a smart bot. You think so? Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that picture. Yep, he's definitely making a smart bot. Do you think it's going to work? Yeah. Yeah, let's find out. Frank screws the piece into place. He lays the smart bot in a rust, rusty red wagon bed, roped into a harness, looped over a pulley, and wired into the motor of the garage door opener. He stands back and gives his work one last look. A robot that will be able to think, learn, and become smarter and smarter. It just needs this lightning power to come alive. Frank punches the garage door opener button. Hmm. Is that what a garage door sounds like? Hmm. I don't know. The motor hums. Hmm. That's a good sound. The rope tightens. The smart bot rises up to the garage roof on Frank's old wagon slash operating table as the skylight opens. Yes! says Frank Einstein with a crazy laugh. His hair and lab coat whip around in the sudden gust of wind blowing into the lab. He grabs his barbecue fork switch to transfer power to the smart bot just um, as the lightning strikes. I wonder if, um, I wonder what else, what, I wonder what else he's going to be up to. I'm curious to find out that too. Ready, Watson? Yells Frank. Watson tightens the strap on his safety goggles and unconsciously shakes his head no, but he gives Frank a floppy yellow thumbs up yes anyway. A wild wind swirls through the lab. This is a good book to read on a stormy yeah. day. The operating table rises up toward the lightning-charged sky. 
Frank counts one, two, then suddenly, bam! Bzzzt. Can you make that noise? <laughs> <laughs> the garage lights blink, flicker. The lab goes black. Frank, oh, the power went off. I think so. Frank hears Watson yell. Oh, no. The powerless garage door motor releases the wagon rope, and the wagon falls, hitting the concrete floor with a terrible metting, metal, help me make the sound, plane crash. Plane crash. What's the sound? Flash. Boom. The, the light. Li yeah. The, the lightning. lightning. And thunder explode exactly at the same time. All right, your turn. Oh, at the same, at the same time, directly overhead, a blue-white charge of electrical energy that was supposed to bring the smart bot to life crackles down the lightning rod and harmlessly through the ground wire and into the earth. In the storm's strobing light, Frank and Watson see a series of snapshot images: the smart bot flying out of the wagon. The smart bot's toaster head spinning one direction. The smart bot's vacuum cleaner body spinning the other. Then darkness. Boom, boom. The thunder from the storm rumbles away. Frank calls a voice from the kitchen doorway. You guys okay in there? Grandpa Al's face, lit by the candle he holds, pokes into Frank's laboratory. What happened? asks Watson. Nice gloves, says Grandpa Al. Must be a power outage, though it's somehow just in this building. Grandpa Al's candle casts a yellow circle of light that falls onto the broken parts of what was Frank's smart bot. What's all this? Oh, just something I was goofing around with for the science prize this weekend, says Frank. It didn't get messed up, did it? Just a little, says Frank, not wanting to worry his grandpa. Frank gathers up the lifeless smart bot head and body parts and places them gently on the workbench. I'll fix it in the morning. Did it work? Mm, probably not. I don't think it worked. Watson peels off his rubber gloves, pats the bodiless toaster head, then slings his backpack over his shoulder. A robot that can teach itself stuff is still a great idea. Frank picks up the sheet of paper he has covered with robot brain plans and sketches of atoms. He wads the paper into a ball and tosses it onto the workbench with all the repair parts and broken junk. Frank nods. Thanks, Watson. See you tomorrow. Frank Einstein turns to leave his lab. Vroom, grumbles the last of the thunder as he closes the kitchen door behind him and Grandpa out. How do you think he feels about his experiment not working? Am I upset? You think so? Yeah. Chapter 2 All is quiet in Frank Einstein's laboratory. The lightning storm has passed. Frank is asleep. The town of Midville is silent. The night is now clear. A beam of silver light from the almost full moon shines down through the rusted windows and skylight. The moonlight glints off the SmartBot's toaster head and the exposed SmartBot circuit brain lying on the top of the pile of video game controller, stopped watch, electric keyboard, hamburger grill, blender, model airplane engine, stomach exercisers, aluminum flux duct hoses, TV remote, magnets, Batteries, locks, old steel file, stereo speakers, shot back, lamps, <laughs> computer monitor, bicycle horn, webcam, glass dome, baby buggy wheels, thermometer, fans, car GPS, collection of rock samples, big silver trash can, and broken talking hug me monkey doll. Every bit of stone, metal, wood, and plastic matter remains still as the faintest night breeze through the drafty garage door stirs the crumpled paper ball on Frank's workbench. The ball rolls one and a half revolutions and hits a coil of copper wire. The copper wire uncoils and brushes against the steel file. The file falls across the flint rock sample. The steel, striking flint, creates a spark. The spark jumps to the center of the Frank-made smart bot brain. The spark races along the thin computer circuit memory chip pathways. 
it doubles, triples, quadruples, and forms a network of interconnected sparks looking an awful lot like a network of interconnected human brain cells. The interconnected web of sparks becomes an idea. The interconnected web becomes a plan. The webcam eye opens, it shudders, blinks, and fires a wireless command to the headless robot body. <laughs> the charge powers on the small LED lights, then speeds into the vacuum cleaner body core. The charge multiplies, splits, and spreads through the robot body. What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. Do you have a guess? Um, um, he's gonna break. You think so? Yeah. One mechanical clamp hand lies still on the workbench. Spark. The clamp opens. Spark. The clamp closes. Spark. The entire clamp hand moves. Intricate waves of power now surge and fill electrified pathways. The mechanical clamp hand unscrews at the back of a video game power pack. The hand gathers the hard plastic shop back, the webcam, the glass dome. The moon disappears behind a passing cloud. In the pitch dark laboratory, two mechanical hands gather and sort through the pile of junk parts and tools on the workbench. The hands turn screws wind springs, adjust gears, bolt, hammer, and build. The hands rewire circuits, shape scrap, attach pieces, secure hoses, and finally put a whole new robot head, robot head, <laughs> toward a newly rebuilt robot body. The cloud passes. How does he do all those experiments? Well, he's not there, remember he went to bed? Oh yeah. So who's doing Wait, it? Um, the grandpa. Grandpa, grandpa went to bed. Um, Frank. Frank is the the scientist who who went to bed. Um, his dad. Oh, it's self. I think it's self. Cause no one else, everyone else went to bed. Yeah. Yeah. The cloud passes. The beam of moonlight shines down on the, to the laboratory again. And now there is something new on Frank Einstein's workbench. Something that wasn't there earlier. Something that thinks. Something that learns. Something that is alive. Wait, it's alive? That's what it says. All right, go to the next page. I want to see. Okay. If it's... Chapter 3. At 8.34 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Frank's alarm clock goes off. And because this is inventor Frank Einstein's alarm clock, of course it doesn't go off by simply ringing. It goes off by way of a hammer on top of an old alarm clock smacking a nail that knocks a peg that frees a 10-speed bicycle gear that drops a little barbell on the end of a chain. That turns another gear and a wheel and another and another and another in a maze of interlocking gears and wheels covering the entire wall until the last wheel turns a one gear. That spins a metal rod that opens the vertical floor to ceiling blinds, filling the room with bright morning sun. How would you like to wake up like that? That would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you would ever build a machine to open your blinds for you? Yeah. Yeah, that could be fun. Frank sits up and scratches his head with both hands. He loves staying with Grandpa Al in this cool old factory he has turned into his house. Fix-it repair shop. And now also a laboratory of Frank's very own. The fix-it shop might not be the most successful business in Midville. People seem to throw stuff away instead of fixing it. And Grandpa Al is always more interested in the fixing than the money-making. But Grandpa Al's shop is the greatest place in the world to make and test any invention Wait, you might dream of. Wait, does Frank have to go to school? 
and Watson. Oh. Well, um, most kids have to go to school. If they Frank, didn't go to school, what do you think they would do instead? Frank, um, learn at home. Learn at home? Maybe. Like how you're learning at home? Yeah. Yeah? Frank throws on jeans, a t-shirt, and his rumpled, soft, washed a thousand times lab coat. He slides on shoes, no socks, because that's how he does his best thinking, in comfort. Frank scientifically observes the model train tracks at his feet. He concludes that he's glad he dis disconnected his model train shoe delivery system last night. That invention isn't quite working yet. Too many early morning shoe train wrecks. I wonder what his, what his plans are going to be next. Yeah, what do you think they might be? Um, he might mix vinegar and, I mean, multi vinegar and, um, and malt vinegar together. Have you ever done that before? No. Oh, I wonder what would happen. <laughs> It'd probably overflow. <laughs> Frank grabs the books, the book on his oversized wooden cable spool beside t bedside table. The smell of pancakes and coffee from the kitchen downstairs hurries him along the wide wooden plank floor hallway under the old Midvale zipper company sign stamped in concrete letters over the doorway arch. Frank hustles past the walls covered with his Grandpa Al's charts and diagrams of the phases of the moon and the constellations. He takes a left down the hall of tectonic plates and the geological time scale. He takes a right past the human skeletal system and the circulatory system. He hops onto the double helix DNA slide, spirals down two floors, and pops through the plant cell, animal cell, swinging doors right into the kitchen. Good morning, Einstein, says Grandpa Al, scooping pancakes out of a frying pan. Good morning, Einstein, answers Frank, repeating their classic joke that he's that's not really a joke. Grandpa Al serves Frank and himself each a steaming stack of pancakes. He turns on the carbon atom light fixture above the table. It glows with a funny mix of six blue proton and six red neutron lights in the center nucleus, surrounded by six occasionally blinking white electron lights. Frank swallows a delicious mouthful of warm pancake, melted butter, and maple syrup. Mmm... So the power's back on? Grandpa Al nods. Yeah, sorry about that. I guess it was my fault. I found the overdue bill notice in the refrigerator this morning. Not sure how it got there, but I paid them some of the money so we can keep the lights on. At least till you finish your project. Don't worry about that, says Frank, feeling bad about his Grandpa Al's forgetfulness. I've got some more ideas to win that prize, just like you did when you were a kid with your super electromagnet. Grandpa Al nods and smiles and looks up at the photo of himself with the Midville Science Prize trophy cup and his magnet above the kitchen mural diagram of an electromagnetic wave. I think that really did start me thinking like a scientist. Frank takes another bite of pancake. Yeah, because you knew so much. Grandpa Al leans back and gives one of his big, easy laughs. Nope, just the opposite, in fact. I started to know how much I didn't know. Science is all about asking questions, not memorizing answers. Failure is just as valuable as success, if you figure out what caused the failure. Well, then my experiment last night was pretty valuable, says Frank. When we lost power, everything got smashed. Sorry, says Grandpa Al. So what's with the Asimov book? You working on robots? Frank downs the rest of his pancake. I'm working on a robot that can learn on its own. Cells connected in networks, not in lines of programming rules. I figure if robot brains can be built to work like human brains, then robots might be able to learn like humans and get smarter and smarter. Interesting, says Grandpa Al. You're using a biophysical model from human neuroscience. Exactly! because human brain cells are arranged in a network like this. Frank sketches in a marker a diagram of interconnected brain cells on the front of Grandpa Al's giant industrial refrigerator. But computers make yes or no decisions following rules, more in a long straight line like this. 
So that kind of robot brain can't learn the way we do. It can only do what it's programmed to do. Mm hmm, Grandpa Al nods. Frank continues excitedly. But what if I made the robot brain like this? I see, says Grandpa Al. Then one brain cell connects with a lot, lots of other brain cells at the same time, making patterns, making thoughts. Frank connects an intricate pattern of cells on his robot brain diagram. Yes, and then the robot can remember those patterns, and those patterns become thoughts, like human brain. And then, suddenly, the life-size Dimetrodon model in the corner of the kitchen gives a lizardly roar. Grandpa Al gives Frank a surprised look. Who could be calling at this hour? Rawr! Grandpa Al's Dimetrodophone rings again. What if your phone sounded like that? Rawr! That'd be funny. <laughs> Grandpa Al pushes the Dimetrodon's eye. The big, sail-shaped back fin lights up like a video screen and displays... Bob and Mary. Oh, says Grandpa Al, it's your mom and dad. Frank answers the prehistoric Dime reptile Trudon call. Phone. <laughs> that's, a cool, that's a fun word, isn't it? Do you want to try reading it again? Dime, Dime Trudon phone. Frank answers the phone. Hello? Hello, Frank. Is that you, sweetie? A fuzzy picture of two faces circled by fur furred orange parka hoods appears on the Dime Tradon screen. Oh, it has a screen, so maybe it's like a TV phone. Or like a Skype call or Zoom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Yep, it's me. Is everything okay? You and Grandpa taking care of each other? What are you doing? Oh, yeah, says Frank. I was just telling Grandpa about my neural net model for artificial intelligence. I'm trying to get it up and running to win the Midville Science Prize. That's nice. And don't forget to take your vitamins, okay? Here's your father. Frank! Hi, Dad. This is the greatest spot yet for travelalloverthe-place.com. <laughs> That's a long word. Travel <laughs> travelalloverthe-place.com. Bottom of the world. <laughs> You know what they call it? What? Sure, says Frank. Antarctica. Ooh, I would love to go to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. It's called Antarctica, son. The South Pole, glaciers, skiing, snowshoeing, penguins, seals. Great, says Frank. You should also check out the ozone hole studies. This is the time of year the hole widens. Whales also, I think. Okay, we gotta run. We'll call you again in a couple days. Check out our blog for more. Oh, look it. We were right. That, look, that looks like a dinosaur, right? Wait, what, where, where are they? Where's his parents? They, they said they were in Antarctica. Oh. See right there? Okay, bye, I love you. The dime trade on phone goes blank. Frank looks at Grandpa Al. Are you sure Dad is your kid? Grandpa Al laughs. Yeah, he never did like science much, but he sure loves to travel. And so does your mom. And that allows us to do all of our experiments. And speaking of experiments, what happened to the toaster? Grandpa Al asks. I can't find it anywhere. Oh, right, sorry, I was using some of the parts for my robot, I'll go get it. In most places in the universe, this is where the adult would give a long lecture about not taking things apart, remembering to put things back the way you found them, the dangers of electricity, and maybe it would be better if you just didn't touch anything ever. But this is a it, this adult is Grandpa Al Einstein. He says, great. Frank heads into his lab and flips on the lights. He searches through the mess of parts and pieces on the workbench and pictures rebuilding his self-educating robot brain. Frank talks to himself as he starts to collect all the toaster parts. I could use more brain cells and fewer connections, he says, holding out one hand as if it were half of a scale. Or I could use fewer brain cells, he says, holding out the other hand, and more connections. He looks over the pile of junk, palms still extended. Thermostat, thermostat, where are you, thermostat? He hears a faint mechanical whirring noise. Something drops into his right palm. I'm laughing, I'm about to laugh because of thermostat. 
<laughs> oh, you were reading ahead? Yeah. But look at the font. Do you see how the words look different? That that word thermostat looks different from the other words? Yeah. I think I'm supposed to read it differently. Thermostat. Thermostat says an electronic voice. Thermostat. I oh, you did that pretty well. Oh, there it is, says Frank. Great, thanks. Frank cradles the toaster parts in one arm and heads back to the kitchen, still thinking out loud. No, but let's read chapter four. Let's read chapter four. I gotta four finish too. chapter three first. And then chapter four. We'll see. Frank cradles the toaster parts in one arm and heads back to the kitchen, still thinking out loud. But now how am I going to get the power, the spark, the... You are welcome, says the electronic voice. Frank freezes suddenly realizing he is not alone. He turns back to look at his workbench and sees that he isn't talking to someone else. He is talking to something else. Frank drops all the toaster pieces with a clink clang and clad. You, says Frank, understanding in a second what has happened. You are alive. I like how he said it. <laughs> yeah. That was the funniest book ever made, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you liked it.